So we are going to spend a little bit of time looking at some slides, a very brief blush overview of psychological first aid. And then I'm going to hand out some, um, oh, actually, I think we might have already handed out some scenarios for you to um, discuss with each other. And we'll do some small group activities. So here we go. Psychological first aid, you've heard a number of similar terms, critical incident stress management, debriefing. Um, there are a number of terms that have been used to describe this uh, over time. So the learning objectives for this afternoon's presentation are basically at the end of this course, at the end of the presentation, you as a participant will be able to identify our basic objectives and intervention strategies of psychological first aid, gain skills needed to implement the intervention strategies of psychological first aid, adapt psychological first aid in diverse settings and with different populations, and as we've been hearing today with your different experiences, anything, you know, the sky's the limit that we could have probably, you know, any opportunity, any kind of population under any different types of circumstances. And we will be appreciating the importance of providing psychological first aid in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Gain confidence in implementing psychological first aid in the immediate aftermath. We will also be talking about ways to enhance our provider care before, during, and after disaster care. I just want to show you folks, you know, a couple of names with lots of alphabet soup after their names. They're wonderful people, national leaders in um, trauma research, uh, treatment, et cetera. Melissa Brimmer, Dr. Brimmer, was my uh, trainer as I went through the Medical Reserve Corps component. This is definitely not an over, it, it is definitely not a comprehensive piece of information is just to give you some of the basic tenets with psychological first aid. How do we know? How do we know anything about responding to disasters? We've looked at this through research, looking at customer feedback, folks who have been through some type of an experience, an incident or an event, disaster research, trauma research, looking at the neurophysiology, the physiology, the emotional, psychological impacts. We've compiled expert consensus over years and decades now. I think most folks understand that PTSD, that acronym for post-traumatic stress disorder, grew out of the uh, Vietnam War and the treatment coming after that. It was certainly not the first term for battle-related or war-related or trauma-related uh, reactions. It was battle fatigue and other kinds of stress terminologies that were used in World War II and World War I. But as a society, and I'm really pleased that Medical Reserve Corps right from the beginning, and as a society we seem to be uh, more fluent in understanding that there is an emotional, psychological, perhaps spiritual component to emergencies or disasters that needs to be considered very, very importantly, upfront and high priority, not as an afterthought. Our experience and our program evaluations. There are five empirically supported early intervention principles. And again, I'm talking about the early intervention, the immediate aftermath, the first few hours, the first few days, maybe the first few weeks or couple of weeks, longer term reactions, impacts, stressors would be something that we then refer to longer term recovery, community based organizations, psychiatric care, nursing, medicine. So we know safety, physical safety, having the person in a safe environment removed from the threat, calming, who noticed the difference in the room when Brinkley and, and Ned came in? I found it so fascinating, and I am an observer of people. I just enjoy human behavior, animal behavior. I enjoyed so much observing the conference in Northampton at the Clarion. It was one of the most laid back, friendly conferences I had been at. And I know many of those same folks. We've traveled in similar circumstances and 
you know, folks were just smiling more, the shoulders were more relaxed, and it was Brinkley and his peers that brought that dynamic to our coming together. Connectedness, which is the opposite of isolation, having people connect, connect with each other, with resources. Self and community efficacy, being able to draw upon our own strengths, draw upon the existing um, structures and systems and organizations and agencies that are already in a community. And hope. Hope is a very important component. Call it positive thinking, uh, call it optimism, call it looking towards what may be positive in a situation is also helpful. So in a nutshell, our definition for PFA is an evidence-informed, modular approach to assist children, adolescents, adults, and I'll also say older adults, and families in the immediate aftermath of disaster and or terrorism. Our principal actions are to establish safety and security. This is what we're doing, safety and security. We're not doing psychotherapy. We're not doing analysis. We're establishing safety and security. Connect. We want to connect people with restorative resources. And those restorative resources may be things that are very simple and tangible. Think about Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, the very bottom foundational component. Food, water, rest, heat, comfort, the environmental things to stabilize and help to restore the resources that have been tested, have been stressed, have been traumatized. We want to reduce stress-related reactions. So for instance, if someone has been through a traumatic event, they've been transported to a shelter, and if the shelter is extraordinarily loud, chaotic, or there are other smells, sights, and sounds that continue, continue, you know, pressing against that, uh, that person's um, sensitivities, we might want to then find a quieter room. Many of our shelters are already pre-designated and they're in schools, they're ADA accessible, and there will be different classrooms so that different groups, families, individuals could find a quiet spot. We want to foster adaptive short and long-term coping. So our short term goes back to the present and the beauty of the, our canine friends that are living right here in the here and now versus we as humans that are of superior intellect <coughs> And we're carrying, you know, the past baggage, you know, clunking along all those suitcases of all the resentments and the hurts and the bad memories, carry that around with us. And, oh, my God, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? And, you know, really, where's the happiness? Come right to the present, restorative services, restorative um, resources. So the short-term peace, present, breathing. <sighs> Today we had Brinkley, when I have psychological first aid and haven't had Brinkley in the past but hopefully will in the future, um, I usually do a little bit of yogic breathing and some stretching with folks or if we can go outside if weather permitting. So we get back into our bodies. You remember how we started this morning and I asked you to go inside to breathe? And just kind of check in with yourself, kind of what brought you here and then if your mind goes wandering off come back in and we want to enhance our natural resilience rather than preventing the long-term pathology so we want to look at some of the skills and behaviors that are helpful in healing who can deliver for a uh, psychological first aid well most folks can most folks can and many folks do it's a part of compassion. It's a part of when we have some empathy from other folks. Delivered by a disaster response person, certainly that first responder or first responders know to bring some sense of safety. You're okay. You're okay now. We're going to help you. Some very concrete you know, words and actions that bring that um, stability forward. First responders, mental health professionals, school personnel. Absolutely. <laughs> Every day you're interacting with kids that are just, you know, woo -woo -woo. <laughs> and, and just bouncing around and each other, staff, how we can interact with other people and bring some of that psychological first aid. I would go as far as saying if we take a look at any of our mainstream media, 
that we're all traumatized in our culture because there's a continued battering of um, traumatic images, messages, or just reinforced that aren't adequately balanced with the other wonderful things that we know that are happening, like all of you people being here together with me. And that's not going to be on the front page of the Republican this afternoon. And I doubt that you're going to hit um, Channel 22 um, this evening, but you should. <laughs> Religious professionals, absolutely. Our faith-based folks are very good, trained with um, grief and other losses and helping and healing. Disaster volunteers, that's us. Health and public health officials. Eight core action steps, contact and engagement safety and comfort, stabilization, information gathering, one, two, three, four, okay. Information gathering, as we have talked about during the day, when folks are able to have a little bit of information about their situation, it helps to reduce the stressors. That's just how we work as humans. We also want to be very mindful to not promise or lend out expectations or assumptions if we don't have in information about what's going on in the incident. And it's okay to say, we don't know, I don't know. I'll ask, you know, I'll ask my coordinator, I'll talk to people as soon as we know, I'm sure we'll get you that information. It's okay, in fact, it's much better, much better. Any day of the week to say, no, I don't know, we're looking forward to that information than trying to make someone feel better with some fantasies. Practical assistance that goes back to the food, the water, the blanket, telephone, cot, restrooms. What's practical? You need a more comfortable chair, you need a pillow. Children with you, do you want to find a play area? Let's figure it out. Practical. Connect with social supports. So social supports can be friends, neighbors, community members, MRC volunteers to provide some supports. Information on coping, again, some basics. Letting someone know in the early stages of an af you know, the aftermath of uh, and the emergency, the incident, the disaster, that you know, sometimes folks do feel the stress reactions and, they, and they're irritable or they're tired or they can't feel like they can't uh, sleep. They're hypervigilant, um, may have headaches. You may find yourself overeating, undereating, using other kinds of substances or self-medicating. These are um, behaviors that are common and we can be mindful of that so that it doesn't bring on another unhealthy impact to the individual. And then linking up with collaborative services. What's in the community? All of our communities to some degree or another have some types of collaborative services and that may be the faith-based organization. In the, some of the larger communities it may be social services, human services maybe professionals, independent folks, and they are out there and available. So be mindful of your community, be mindful of the resources that are already there for you to be able to access. Just as school personnel know what's beyond the realm of what we can take care of here, and when do we need to refer someone out. A physician knows that, what's beyond the realm of my expertise and I need to go to a referral to a specialist. Provider care management. I changed this presentation around. I took the back end and I put it up front. This was the last part that usually came after doing some scenarios and group activities. And by the end of the afternoon, the end of the day, the last slide of the last presentation, we'd get the message, oh yeah, by the way, take care of yourself. <laughs> right? How typical is that? I, you know, I think of my undergraduate and I think of my graduate work and I think of so many different conferences and things. And by the way, you know, your teacher, your human service provider, your first responder, you're, you're providing some kind of service. And by the way, don't forget to take care of yourself as an afterthought or the end. We put this forward. After the tornadoes, I said, uh-uh. <laughs> we're putting this, we're moving this one forward. We want to rotate where workers are moved from the very highly exposed ass assignments, so with folks that are the most traumatized, or an environment that is stressful, to varied levels of exposure. Enforce support by providing regular supervision, some case conferences, we've talked about this debriefing, these are different semantics for very similar processes, 
and have partners in peer consultation, which is a nice way of saying practice a buddy system. So um, as a coordinator, one of the things I want to do is to really protect, force protection is a, it's, it's a creed for me. It's, it's something that I feel very, very strongly about. When I ask an MRC volunteer to deploy, I'm ta I want to take care of them. I want to make sure that they're safe. I want to make sure that the environment that they're going into is safe on all levels, physically, you know, emotionally, mentally. Respiratory, I want them to be in a, in a place where they are safe. And I also want to be sure that um, they are appropriate to go into that type of a situation. So we have small units. You know, we're not millions and millions strong, but our small units serve a purpose because we do get to know each other. And I get to know someone's strengths, and they get to know my weaknesses and where we would best fit. So we need to be honest and forthcoming about those preferences. And product, um, having trainings, and certainly like today, coming together, meeting other people, hearing the experiences and the depth of skills that we have in this room today, it's pretty impressive. So something for you to be remembering to take care of yourself, but also as a coordinator for me <coughs> to remember to have MRC volunteers limit the daily um, exposure to the most severe cases, use a buddy system, use benefit time, personal time, vacation time. Now, these are wonderful words, and it's very prudent guidance. In the immediate aftermath of a disaster, most of us are just go, go, go. And Wednesday, those tornadoes hit. People were freaked out didn't sleep Wednesday night into Thursday, still running on no sleep from the night before, probably got to sleep on Thursday night, got three or four hours of nasty sleep because they had been so fueled up on caffeine and lousy food. And by Friday, we're starting to fray. And we start three days. Remember our little 72-hour piece? 72 hours, you could measurably see that our first responders, and I don't necessarily mean fire and police because they have shifts built in, but people who are responding from the community were really starting to deteriorate. A week later, I called it F-bomb Friday, and it was not pretty. People had deteriorated. They had not been taking care of themselves. The stress between the cortisol and the fight, flight, fear, the unknown, the lousy food, the long hours, the hard conditions, folks needed to be told, stay home. And that was something that some folks didn't want to hear. Because you look around and you just say, imagine the, the images that you've seen, say, from Haiti, or the Philippines, or from Japan. You look around and say, I can't possibly stop or rest. These people have lost everything. They need my help, which is true. Yes, I get that. But I need you to be healthy because I'm going to need you tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. And we need you to be well. So please. Stand down. We want a buddy system so that we're watching each other, looking out for each other. And we get to use time, um, if possible, take some personal time. My, um, my own little story of leaving Munson, uh, it was on the second Friday. Wednesday was the tornado. Second Friday was the first day that I left the community. And my jurisdiction was all of Hamden County. You can't get, you can't get to where you want to go. The normal being able to have the psychological freedom, the mobility to just get in my car and go and check out the indescribable, overwhelming impacts of it being right here in your home and right in your, you know, right in where you live. It's just so hard to share unless one has been through it. By that second Friday, I took my first, I said, I need to take some time. And I drove to East Long Meadow Starbucks, which I call my office. It's my satellite. And I walked in, and the baristas know me. And um, 
I had been driving from Munson through Hamden to East Long Meadow, and it's just so hard to describe the visceral feeling of there were green lawns. Oh my God, there were, I still get shivers. There were trees. There were trees that weren't splintered and shattered in the most grotesque, ripped apart configurations that one could imagine. And I got to the register and they you know, asked me what I want and they're really good. They know just about everybody's drink. It just blows my mind. And I just bawled. I just, the tears, I hadn't cried up to that point. I just bawled. <laughs> and I knew someone in line was sniffing and sniffling all over them. They're like, how are you doing? I'm like, <laughs> and normal, it was a normalcy that just shocked me into being able to have that release. Kathy, you were talking about like um, people working so many days and that, you know, like that, um, the F-bomb, you call the F-bomb Friday. There isn't like a schedule like you would work two days you would mandated to take that third day to off for mental health. Work two more days, take that third, the next third day off as a mental health just so that you can have volunteers that are fresh, mm -hmm. so to speak? It, yes, and no, we didn't do it. Okay. And yes, we have learned from it. Okay. And the pros have been doing it, okay. and they do do it. And we learned that we needed to be able to pace those deployments. Um, that was part of our, our lessons learned. Otherwise, you burn everybody out. Right. Correct. So, so if, you had, if you had the tornado to do over again, you might query some of us as to say, are you available now or better next week? That absolutely, kind of absolutely. I, in fact, we have databases that we've been able to get, um, purchase software to be able to manage those components. Mm -hmm. The state had purchased the database for the MA response, mm -hmm. but it had not been rolled out. Right. So uh -huh. we had that, and, but the timing, you know, we hadn't trained on it, we hadn't had an ability to do that. It was actually one of my peers, a terrific woman um, out of Hopkinton, who is the MRC coordinator for that central mass component, that she took over the coordinating. Michael did it for quite a bit, uh, scheduling folks. And we had people coming from the Cape, from Tewksbury, from the Northeast, from different areas. So after we, um, the first MRC volunteers from our region were doing the first couple of days, we actually, in a natural evolution or an organic evolution, had to reach out to people from units in other parts of the state. Another um, issue that came up was Munson, East Long Meadow, Springfield, we're all border communities with Connecticut. We had Connecticut folks ready to deploy that would be a whole heck of a lot easier than three hour drive from Fall River or two hours or whatever the distance was. Hampshire was assisting Hamden, Berkshire, Franklin were coming, CERT, MRCs working together. And we didn't have, and I don't believe till this day, because in Hurricane Sandy, we didn't have interstate deployment in place for volunteers. The fire departments have. You do. Yeah. Well, the they're... pros have had those interstate agreements yeah. for years and years. Politics, bureaucracy. So something for us to continue working on. Great question. And boy, you know, we learned the hard way because we killed ourselves. We did. I just worked around the clock and was exhausted. And I can honestly tell you it's taken, you know, many, many months to get back to stabilizing. Um, many, after an emergency or disaster, you'll see um, certain positions will change in you know, someone who's the EMD or someone else, and, and those, the person is really toasted, burnt out. It, so many difficult things happen that having a fresh start uh, frequently occurs. Providers, we want to watch the too long by themselves without checking in. Lessons learned. Working around the clock with few breaks, feeling like they're not doing enough. Excessive intake of sweets and caffeine or alcohol or self-medicating in any other fashion. Here are some of the attitudes that are blocks to being able to care for ourselves. 
and we have to watch this mentality and I say this to you and when I say we I include myself in this truly it would be selfish to take time to rest others are working around the clock so should I the needs of the survivors are more important than the needs of the helpers you've always you've probably heard other people say and maybe you've said it yourself or you know someone that'll say you know sleep eh you know it's overrated whatever we can get it you know next week or the week after I can continue to contribute the most by working all the time and truly I am the only one who knows X Y and Z and you know what that might be true and if it is train someone else okay please you know our custodian who is the Oprah up the shelter lived in um, Stafford Connecticut which is down a road called Route 32. You go due north to get over the Connecticut line to Munson. Well, he couldn't get past the state police. The roads are closed, blocked. But I'm the custodian. I've got the key. I need to open the shelter. He ended up going all the way around Wilbraham and through these different circuits to, to get to that spot. And he was the only one X, Y, and Z. Would it might have been helpful to have had a backup, a second or a third person that would be able to open the building. Maybe the police department could have a key so that we could access that. Lessons learned. Well, and again, the fire department, for instance, has the master key. Probably nobody called them. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have that all the time. Okay. And I don't know if that's true for every community, Usually. but those are questions that, you know, the average... Um, the average bear doesn't know these things, right? The average bear doesn't know that there's an emergency management director in the community, that the school has plans that you can access and you can ask for. And if you have additional needs, that you can ask the emergency management director to you know, put you on a confidential list of someone who has additional needs, that if electricity is going to be out for X period of time, uh, you know, due to some kind of uh, durable goods or devices you're using for your medical needs, you might need to be helped to get to shelter. Is that information getting out to other community resources so that they know there's somebody that can open a shelter, there's somebody that... I think we have come a long, 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 long way. Health and human services, public safety, public education were completely, completely separate after September 11th, and then reaffirmed through Rita and Katrina, public safety, public health came closer. We're not, but came closer. So we have certs, and we have MRCs, and we have EMDs that know that there are MRCs, and we have mayors that are actually taking ICS, and we have, and then it was pandemic, H1N1, when schools, where we gave vaccination, started to understand Oh, so the school emergency response team doesn't have to act in isolation from the town emergency response plans because you know it, they were complete. Now, let's inform, and how are we going to do that? You tell five people, you tell five people, you tell five people. You know, if we all continue to push this out in our professional networks, the value of those pharmacy students, the value of the psychiatrist who is here, the value of people who are doing this professionally, the people who the interest is through the animals, and that's how we continue to push that out. And yes, that information is available right now here as we stand, sit, and breathe on thousands of websites, on posters in different buildings. But all of us know that health education, public information, it's repetition, repetition, repetition. My vision is that we have uh, September, which is National Preparedness Month, that every public school system, pre-K through 12, has a program on emergency preparedness. Just like every October is a month dedicated to? Fire safety. Yes, National Fire Prevention Month, right? Good, so what do you do in October? The That's Jackie. <laughs> We pay her extra. <laughs> Fabulous. I want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Show me the money. So, yes, we've grown, you know, we have a generation, maybe even two generations now, 
of young people who have been raised at October and they come home, you know, in kindergarten. Mommy, Daddy, where's the smoke detector? Mommy, where's our meeting place? Where are we going to meet? Well, let's meet at the big rock. Let's meet at the big tree. And what do you mean? Mom, do you know what stop, drop, drop and roll means? So we have our little people, you know, reminding us of some of the things that we need to know. We haven't come to an understanding in our region that we're prone to earthquakes. We're due for one every 15,000 years geologically, and we're way overdue now. We're way overdue. So what do we do? Stop, drop, and roll? No. Stop, drop, and hold on. Grab shelter underneath. But we haven't exercised that. We haven't drilled on that. We haven't pushed that kind of information out. Very importantly, the readjustment period. We talk about the debriefing. Um, going back into your normal life after going through an experience where you have witnessed or participated or been impacted, affected by some kind of traumatic experience, a readjustment period, reentry. Expect a reentry period. Talk to other people that you interact with, coworkers and management. Let them know that you participated in some type of a response. Participate in formal help if the extreme stress persists for you as a person who volunteered to go into a situation that was difficult. Ask help in parenting if you feel irritable or have difficulties adjusting. We need to be able to talk and communicate and have that encouraged. Prepare for worldview changes that may not be mirrored by others in your life. You've seen something, you've smelled something. A lot of folks know our olfactory senses, the smell of different, talk about those freezers. When I talk to you about those freezers and those stinky, I can, you know, that memory is very strong. Talk about it, it may not be mirrored by other people in your life. Increases, um, many folks feel that their worldview changes and maybe their spiritual or philosophical meanings are impacted. Remember to keep first things first and take care of you. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to get to our scenarios. Core action one, contact, engagement. You're meeting a person, how do you present yourself to someone so that you are open and receptive at the same time asking for permission to talk to come closer into their space. Explain your objectives. Hi, my name's Kathleen. I'm with the Medical Reserve Corps and my show my t-shirt or badge and um, we're working in the shelter today and I'm here to help so I'm just wondering if there's anything that you need and I can come close to the person so that they can hear me perhaps it's a child and if he's a little kid I might want to talk on their level and meet them face to face perhaps it's an elderly person and I may need to get closer to the <laughs> ear so they can hear what I am saying and slow my rate of talk down, my language. We can ask about immediate needs and then listen to what it is they're asking for. Safety and comfort. Safety, comfort, security. Safety, comfort, security. The goal is to enhance our immediate and ongoing safety and provide physical and emotional comfort. So I put this slide up here um, for purpose because I wanted to talk about whether or not we feel that it's appropriate for MRC volunteers to um, buddy up to somebody and, and, you know, I'm so sorry things are going so tough for you. How did that feel? For me, fine. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Some folks, we're just meeting. I, I took it. First. Would you like a hug? Yeah. I, I don't like that. No. And I was going to do it with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. So touch. Maybe these two ladies are sisters. I don't know. But they're certainly erring on the side of caution. I would discourage physical touch and certainly not in an intimate way for your own safety, for the other person's safety. That's just reinforcing that they don't have control of their environment for a stranger to come up and to be physical and touching and close and whatnot. And some folks are really touchy-feely and others aren't. And we get to just be cautious about that, to be respectful 
about personal space and to be appropriate in our professional approach to individuals. And I thank you for bearing with me as I do that. And I try to do these things physically, show you in a group when I'm doing the presentations because you just get to see how like, yeah, not so, I mean, you're cool and I appreciate it and some people, it would be fine. And someone might ask for a hug and then you get to decide, is that appropriate for you? So thinking about boundaries. Think about those boundaries. You know, maybe um, it's very different to um, stand next to someone and put a hand near them so that you can hear me and I can be closer to you, particularly when there's a lot of noise in the background, distractions, etc. With the child getting closer on a one-to-one. -one. When I've done my counseling work with young people, having that young person in the chair and me on the carpet, I'm looking up, the young person's looking down at me. That's an entirely different dynamic because they spend their entire life looking up at big people. So right away, we've changed that dynamic. And that young person gets to have a sense of a little bit of power, a little bit of um, being less vulnerable. Someone had a hand raised? Yeah. Did I? Yes. That's part of what used to be the I'm looking over you ask. Right. Right. Say, yeah. I'm trained and you know, I can help right. you. Do you need assistance? Okay. Do you, do you need want assistance? You That's have part to of ask permission right. to touch. <clears throat> yeah. right. Ironically, all of what you're demonstrating about this ask permission, being less threatening, that's complete animal training. Mm. That in working with the animals, that yeah. is exactly how we have to present it. Mm. And 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 if you stand, oh, we're all animals. if you stand over the animal, the animal will become aggressive. Mm -hmm. As you talked about not bending over the child, mm -hmm. that is what will happen. Fascinating. So we back up and make it a non-threatening situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have the opportunity and um, power, lose that, use that term kind of loosely, to create an environment. We can escalate and we can de-escalate. We can provide safety and comfort, or we can increase the stressors and the tensions. So being aware and going slow and seeing how the other person's body language um, is transmitting and communicating to you can be helpful. Acutely bereaved. Listen carefully with symptom. Acutely bereaved. Distress. Crying, screaming, shaking, sweating. Know that there are different cultural norms, again, about approaching and comfort and what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. It may not be appropriate for me as a woman to approach a man in a different cultural group. It may not be appropriate for a man to approach women in a different cultural group that were unknown to each other. And how do we find out about the cultural norms? Ask. Again, is it okay? Who appears to be a leader in a group? You can usually figure that out in a family or a group of people very easily by looking at who's taking charge, who is the person communicating. Grief reactions vary from person to person. Makes sense, right? Grief reactions vary from me to me, from the morning, afternoon, night, <laughs> right? Any of us, we're, again, going back to the, we're in a dynamic process, things change. And helping member, family members, particularly to respect differences in grieving. We can ask uh, survivors if they have any religious or spiritual needs. Is there a clergy member? Is there someone um, from a faith-based community that you're involved in that you would like us to contact who might be able to come here and meet with you or know what it is you've been through and they can contact you? We do not get to judge. We do not get to contradict. We don't get to correct what people say about their religious beliefs. That is not our role. It is not our role. 
This is not a time to proselytize. This is not a time to evangelize. This is not a time to fix someone's psyche that's really whacked out and messed up and you know the right way. And if you just put them on the right track, they'd be all set. We get to listen. We get to hold them in the space that they're in and, and appreciate that they're doing whatever emotional discharging they're doing and however they're doing it to um, heal. Survivors want to pray. We can also help them find a suitable place. Just as we talked about earlier, um, folks that need a quiet area, folks that need a dark area, someone as a child that needs less stimulation, let's think about that. Stabilization, it, we want to just get right to calm and orient um, emotionally overwhelmed and distressed survivors. When folks might need some stabilization, the glassy-eyed and vacant, talk about deer in the headlights, you don't have to have medical training to be able to recognize that. We know when someone is distraught, if they're unresponsive, you're trying to communicate, hello, can I talk to you? Uh, do you what's your name? Do you have, and there's no response, they're unable to communicate, disoriented, don't know where they are, place, time, what is the event that is happening. Strong emotional responses, uncontrollable physical reactions, certainly if someone is physical, throwing a chair, overturning a table, slamming doors, banging against a wall, those are right away, that's outside of our realm. That's outside of our realm. We need security. We need to help find out if we can transport someone to EMS, um, to ER, or to a suitable medical facility, so for their safety and for our safety. Frantic searching behavior, Compulsive behaviors, a woman looking through her pocketbook, or I can't, geez, I can't find my keys, I, can't, I don't know where, I'm, you know, that type, of, I know, we go through it every day, right? <laughs> what is she saying about me here? Well, you mean that, you mean this morning as I was leaving the house, I was psychologically, dis okay, yeah. Grounding, we get to ask the person, if you look and listen, um, orient to your surroundings, Talk about an aspect of a situation that might be under control, that might be hopeful. A school shooting. We know that that is an extraordinarily horrific, emotional, traumatizing oh, incident, event. And parents will come. Is there a reunification system, um, site for parents to come to that is off campus of the actual building where children may still be, but you can't access it because law enforcement has closed it down? As an MRC, volunteer, if I'm not impacted personally, because it's a community that I live in, if my child is not one of the ones, if I go through my checklist that I would be appropriate for that, that I might be able to make contact. And maybe it's another parent that I already know from the soccer field, but we're not best of friends. I could say, Mary, can I, would you want me to, you know, can we go talk? Can we hang out? And casually find a way to connect, to bring forward that stabilization. And I don't know when we're going to have information, but we do know, we do know that there's, the active shooter has been disposed of or taken down. We don't know when the kids are going to be released. What we know, but not to go beyond what we know. What's hopeful, what's positive, breathe in, breathe out, slowly and deeply. Let's try it. Breathe in, and breathe out. One more time, just for the luxury of breathing. Five non-distressing things. That's a great one to do with young people. And if you have a group of young people, OK, folks, we are going to talk about this is not a good day for us, right? This is not a good day. We're going to talk about what's OK. I have my backpack, <laughs> I have my lunch bag, you know. You told us that the police cut the bad guy and we can talk about what's going well. Gather information, does someone need an immediate referral? Do we need a transport? Do we need ambulance? Do we need a first responder? Do we need a paramedic? Do we need to get someone to ER? Do we need a crisis team uh, intervention? Do we need to have them get to a a psych evaluation and or bring those resources to where we are at now. What other services are available and use those 
interventions tailored to the situation. Practical assistance, now, here, now, present, here, now, present. Think about Brinkley. Think about Brinkley, right here, right now. I love how he put his chin like, he's like. Yeah. 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 You know, they're just so with it. I just <laughs> admire. I'm going to come back as a dog. What are our most immediate needs? Prioritize. Clarify the need. This is what I think I heard you saying. You need me to contact your aunt, who will be able to contact other folks. And this is the phone number. Did I get it right? Play it back. It gives you a little bit of time. It builds the communication. It helps us to verify that information. OK, so discuss an action. What are some of the responses? What are some of our possibilities? We can connect you up with some social supports. You talked about a clergy member. We can make a phone call. And is, is that, am I hearing that that's what you want? Confirm it. Please. Are you, are you suggesting we should go for more of an open question and not one that gets into a yes, no answer? Like getting them engaged, getting them to participate in the conversation? Because if you give them yes, no, it keeps them isolated? Preferably. I like that the way that you phrase that. When we're able to assist people in opening up, as we were told by Ned that Brinkley's presence was effective and folks were able to open up and begin their healing on another level that the yes, no, superficial close down didn't offer. So I think that that's a goal. It may not be what actually happens, but if you're able to assist a person in relaxing to a point that they're able to share more, that's good. OK, social supports, a little bit about coping. We get to explain what do we currently know. We get to know, uh, explain to survivors what are the resources. You're going to have Red Cross, and they're going to be coming, and they'll assign case managers, and they will help you with the whole piece about your home or your shelter or the apartment that was impacted. It'll probably be a long-term um, solution, but you can expect to hook up with some folks. Here's a phone number. Call the you know, hotline, et cetera, et cetera. Identify reactions that might be common, symptoms, distress. Stress is a normal reaction to the abnormal situation. Promote self-care and family care. There are a lot of agencies that are providing services. Connect with some of them. 